the oil block party. This rant isn't so much about how the event is coming, the what is coming. This isn't about the how. That's off in the distance. This focuses more on the why. Why now? Why are all these strange things happening in 2020? Well, let's start with the obvious. Nine out of every ten problems in the world involve money. Money is the root of all evil. Money's most powerful ability is to allow bad people to continue doing bad things. No matter what religion you follow, be it Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, or Christianity, you've probably heard the phrase that we all still worship money. Mm, that is only partially true. Money in whatever form it takes, the dollar, the pound, the ruble, etc., is just free time. The more money you have, the less you have to work. Most lottery winners stop working. It's simple genetics. We're mammals. We like doing things only when we get pleasure out of it. And being human, we really don't like being told what to do. If a genie popped up and granted you a wish, there is a high degree of probability that you would wish for money, preferably cash, because you can touch it. We are conditioned to want this. All forms of media push this narrative. It's not logical, but we do it anyway. Cash is just paper. But it is the common denominator of the world. You could wish for a brick of gold, or ten bricks of gold, but good luck spending it. Eventually, you'll have to trade it in for the paper. A little wish tip. You shouldn't be asking for cash. It can let you do some fun things, sure, but you're thinking too small. What you should be wishing for is a trillion barrels of oil underneath your property. Get that, and you become the most powerful person in the world. Despite what you might think, the most valuable substance in the world isn't gold or platinum or diamonds or even uranium. Of course, per ounce, those items are off the charts. But they are still just another form of direct currency. They are a more dense form of cash. It's much easier to carry a small bag of diamonds than a hundred pounds of money. The substance that changed everything, and I mean everything in the world, was oil and the engines that used it. It is the greatest tool of our civilization, and it became the ultimate drug from which there was no escape. Every aspect of your life and every person you have ever known is only here because of oil. It built the empires that we now live in. It built the network I am talking on. It is the reason you are in a house somewhere listening to this. It is the beginning and the end of modern civilization. And since we don't like to talk about it in school, I'm going to give you some of the broad strokes. For most of our history, we didn't know what to do with oil. It was just sticky pools of stuff sitting on top of the ground. Then, around 1900, we created engines that could use it as fuel. And it instantly made life easier because you didn't have to work as hard. The machines did it for you. See where I'm going with this? A single barrel of oil is the equivalent of 25,000 hours of manual labor. And it can be pumped out of the ground for almost nothing. In the military, it would be known as a force multiplier. And military might was based on how much oil you have, or had, in this case. In the beginning, there were only three major oil fields. Texas, in the United States, Baku, in the former Soviet Union, and the lakes of Venezuela. From these, the modern empires started. World War I and II were fueled by them. Oil is the reason the Soviet Union survived World War II, and it is the reason that the United States became king of the hill, for better or worse. And then, after World War II ended, the United States started maximizing what could be done with oil and all the amazing things that followed. It became the only snake oil that not only lived up to the hype, but exceeded it. With the engines now being used for peace, mostly, we literally created the American dream out of thin air. Everyone not only had running water, electricity, and air conditioning if they wanted it, but they also had the chance to live or own a house much larger than they needed, and cars that they could drive anywhere, for no reason at all. These things that I just mentioned, these modern conveniences, don't seem much to us now. But back then, it was a big deal. The other countries looked at the United States in awe and wonder. We became the first house party of the world. It was a sight to behold, and we knew it. We spread our message everywhere. Look what we've accomplished, and what your country can do. 
We created products and wanted everyone else to buy them. As the saying goes, be careful what you wish for. Many people know what consumerism is. Few have heard the term runaway consumerism. It simply means that when a society completely takes care of its basic needs, that being food, shelter, and clothing, then the only way it can grow is to create products that they don't need. America became the living embodiment of this, and oil became the building blocks of the consumer world. All modern plastics are made from oil. Think of every plastic item in your house right now. None of it is possible without the refinement of petroleum. Combine that with all major fertilizers, cosmetics, medicine, and clothing, and you get over 6,000 oil-based products. That's products, not brands. So when I say disposable diapers are made from oil, every brand combined totals one product, and there's 6,000 of them. Your life is literally surrounded by petroleum products. Why am I beating this drum so hard? Because I can't overestimate how the coming changes will affect us and the people that are born after us. Americans like showing off, and when we figured out all the fun and time-saving things we could do with oil, we just had to flaunt it to the world, who in turn, slowly but surely, wanted the same things we had. We went from being an oil house party to an oil block party. And what's wrong with that? Everyone wins, right? We can take jet planes to other countries, rent cars and drive around, and you don't even have to be a millionaire to do it. Not even close. And if you were already wealthy, well, your life became excessive. Why buy a ticket on a plane when you can own your own plane? Or three planes? Oil meant you could own multiple houses in different countries, and you could travel between them in mere hours. Then the planes got bigger, and boats got bigger. Cities were being built in the desert. Buildings just kept going up and up, and no one cared about the future because it was limitless, right? Not so fast. Now that I think about it, not so fast should have been the slogan on a t-shirt a long time ago. But let's face it, we're human. And human ingenuity sometimes gets us into trouble. In 1950, if you would have asked any geologist or oil expert how long it would take to get a trillion barrels, not gallons, barrels of oil out of the ground, they would have said hundreds of years. And given the tools and technology they had at the time, they would have been accurate. That should be more than enough time to figure out a way to create a sustainable civilization once the supplies start to dwindle. I agree. Hundreds of years should be more than enough. Don't forget, though, that oil is a drug. And like all drugs, it gets used more and more. To quote the comedian Dennis Leary, let's get an eight ball of cocaine. It will last us all weekend. Ten minutes later, you're getting another eight ball. And that will last you all weekend. See what I'm doing there? And that's what happened. We showed countries how great it was to be hooked on oil, and then they became hooked. And the block party grew and grew, and what should have lasted hundreds of years only lasted 70. Now, 70 years still sounds like a long time, but if you're listening to this and not collecting Social Security, you might understand how severe the situation is. Your first reaction will probably be denied. It is the most predictable. The media doesn't talk about it, and the oil industry surely would have known, and yes, of course they did. They got their first sobering look back in 1970 when the U.S. oil production started declining. It was coming out of the ground slower. The same thing happened to Baku and the lakes of Venezuela. If you can't get your drugs locally, then you get them from somewhere else. The block party cannot be stopped. We knew where the rest of it was, and I'm sure you know these names by heart now. Kuwait. Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. The U.S. started hitting them hard by the early 90s and never let up. Yes, there were some small, smaller fields that could help with demand. We had Alaska, Russia had Siberia, the U.K. had the North Sea. Don't get me wrong, there are still some billions of barrels out there. That's not the problem. The real problem is the block party now has too many houses and some of them are jam-packed. I'll be as blunt as I can here for clarity. There isn't enough oil to go around, and the powers that be have known this for some time. You say, so why didn't they put policies in place? Why didn't they try to sh slow us down? They did, 40 years ago, but we weren't having it. All their efforts fell on deaf ears, but really, does that surprise anyone? How exactly do you go to groups and tell them to slow down? Hey, giant corporation, you should make less products and less money. 
hey, military general, you should make your army smaller. And the consumers, we couldn't even get most of them to drive cars with smaller engines. No one goes into a party and tell people to do less cocaine. It just doesn't work. No one wants to hear it and they are enjoying the drugs way too much. So what do you do if you're the powers that be knowing the day will come when the block party will end? Well, you prepare the best you can. And when the time arrives, you kill the demand for oil as quickly and decisively as possible and see how close you can get the population to, for lack of a better term, cold turkey. The trick here is you can't just tell the block party that the drugs are running out because people would just start burning houses down. Honesty is not always the best policy, despite what you may have heard. You lie to them. You give them an alternate reason not to do drugs, like create a huge rainstorm, or I don't know, tell them not to go outside because there's some flu-like virus that could kill them dead. That'd probably do it. And that part worked. I will give credit where credit is due. The demand for oil has plummeted. Far less are driving regularly. No one is flying. Consumerism is down because people have way less disposable income, etc. The party has come to a sudden, jarring, fear, fear-fueled halt. The question now is, what do you do with all the people? I get that you have created a situation where most non-essential goods are temporarily not being created, curbing the runaway consumerism I mentioned earlier. But what do you do with the billions of unemployed people worldwide? Remember that you still have to feed them, and they are still going to keep having kids who also need to be fed, and so on. What's the plan now? And that's where we leave off this rant, with a question mark. Something to think about next week and as we continue 2020. The strangest year in our history.